and welcome to Roundtown Valley United Methodist Church's remote worship for Sunday, September 17th, 2023. Please join us for our in-person worship at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings here in Stone Ridge. And if anybody is interested in a Zoom meeting to discuss parish matters, it will be on Tuesday, September 19th at 7 p.m. Please contact Pastor Caroline for information. Thank you. Please join me for the call to worship. When the tides of fear seem to overwhelm us, we cry out, Lord, come to us and lead us to paths of safety. When we feel lost and alone and we wonder if anyone cares about us, we cry out, Lord, come and heal our wounded spirits. When turbulence within and without seem to threaten us, we cry out, Lord, bring us peace. Now let us pray. O oh God, just as we look into a mirror to see any soiled spots on our face, so let us look to you in order to understand the things that we have done amiss. We are like a reed shaken in the wind. We are inexpressibly weak. Leave us not to ourselves, but dwell in our hearts and guide our thoughts and actions. Amen. It is a maid I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Today's first reading is from Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel, and so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the, at the, morning watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, 
the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people, people feel, feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Our second reading today is from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 13. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat much must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that, what, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, every knee shall, <clears throat> so then each of us will be held accountable to God. Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. This morning's reading from the Gospel comes from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay 
his entire debt, so my Heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You've got to hand it to Peter. He says the darndest things to Jesus. Things that you were maybe wondering about but were too embarrassed to ask because you think that everyone would think you're not too bright. Things that sound a lot like the anonymous pleas for insight into newspaper and online and vice columns. But Peter's isn't anonymous. His name is attached to his utterances forever. Thank you, Peter. We were kind of wondering about this stuff already, actually. But yikes. Jesus' words here, tucked in the midst of teachings about the kingdom of heaven and proper behavior for people in a community of faith, maybe the two could be related, are, are really, really challenging. As in, this faithful living thing is going to require a lot from you. Peter's question that starts off today's reading is simple enough. If someone sins against him, how often should he forgive? Should he go the extra, extra, extra mile and, huh, I know this sounds ridiculous, but forgive seven times? The way he puts it, you can tell that Peter thinks he's obviously going overboard to suggest forgiving someone as many as seven times. Unfortunately for Peter, he does not get kingdom points for his generous septuple forgiveness proposal. Jesus' answer is a big nope to seven times forgiveness. Not seven times, I tell you, but 77 times. Some older translations even put it as 70 times seven, and that works out to 490. But whether it's 77 or 490 doesn't matter that much. The point seems to be that Jesus wants us to forgive again and again and again, expecting that somewhere as we practice this forgiving reflexively, somewhere we'll lose count. And that losing count is something we try so hard not to do. Keeping track, knowing the score, knowing how much, how many, what do we owe, or what are we owed, these are the things that we're taught to pay attention to. Watch your credit score. It will affect the other numbers in your life when you apply for a loan. You see this deeply ingrained attention to what's owed. In the parable of the king and the slaves, the first of whom owed the king 10,000 talents. How much is that? Well, some estimates value a single talent at 6,000 days wages for a laborer. So 10,000 of those is an insanely huge amount, between 150,000 and 165,000 years wages, depending on which study Bible's notes you're using. Adjusted for inflation, I'd say it translates into a gazillion bazillion dollars. There is no way in the world that anyone in their right mind would lend that kind of money to anyone, particularly not a slave, and no way in the world that anyone, particularly a slave, could ever in a million years come close to paying it back. So the whole thing with the slaves falling on his knees and pleading, have patience on me and I will pay you everything to his Lord of the slave, and the Lord of the slave having pity on him, releasing him and forgiving the debt, it, it, it's just all mind boggling. It's hard to see anyone in the parable doing any of that with a straight face. Surely anyone forgiven and released from such a ginormous obligation would live the rest of their days absolutely overflowing with gratitude and generosity all day, every day. It would be like the biggest pay it 
forward chain of the drive through ever. But that's not how the story works, is it? Moments after he is released from the debt, the slave meets a fellow slave who owes him a more understandable debt, maybe four months' wages. And release and forgiveness of said debt are not slave one's approach. No, pay it all, pay it now. Slave two pleads, have patience with me and I will pay you. Does that sound familiar? It should, because it is exactly what slave one said to the king, even though he had no possibility of being able to repay. Hearing slave two implore him with the very same words he's just used on the king, does slave one respond the same way the king did? with release and forgiveness? Well, no. It's off to prison with slave two. As Presbyterian pastor D. Mark Davis says, in a parable full of ridiculous proportions, this is the most ridiculous movement yet. This would never happen. It would be almost like a bank that has been bailed out of billions of dollars worth of loans built on a failed scheme of sub-zero interest rates, turning around and foreclosing on a house that someone bought while taking advantage of those rates. It would be like Christians presuming forgiveness for a history that includes all manner of violence and coercion, calling all Muslims violent because of the actions of a small portion of Islamic extremists. It would be like a church member having been forgiven all manner of sinfulness, turning toward a gay or lesbian person and saying, you don't belong here. Come on, Jesus. This kind of stuff never happens. If this all seems wrong to you, you're in good company. Remember how the gospel continues? When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt, because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured. There's some payback for you on steroids. Jesus' story is likely not what Peter expected when he asked if he needed to be ready to forgive the same person seven whole times. If asked, I think that most people would agree that forgiveness is a good thing. But getting down to the details of who and what and why we should forgive, things get complicated. In our payback reality, the idea that we would forgive reflexively and repeatedly without reservation sounds kind of ridiculous. Somehow, when we're in church, we can go along with our being forgiven by God, but it doesn't take long in day-to-day -day living to see that we are pretty sold on the idea of payback. And forgiveness is something to be extended sometimes upon request, to those who deserve it and will be appropriately contrite going forward. Again, quoting from D. Mark Davis, the viciousness of the Lord's response in the parable is now attributed to how God reacts when we, who are forgiven much, do not forgive another. I expect that we are not ready to accept either A, that our debt to God our, that our debt that God has forgiven was really all that hefty to begin with, or B, that the debt we refuse to forgive someone else is really all that light. Without accepting either of those premises, this parable becomes something that is more for other people than oneself. If you care about the parable for yourself, though, think about those basic forgiveness questions. What's forgiveness for? Who's forgiveness for? And why? What? What is it for? Does forgiveness boil down to money? Hurtful things said? 
wrong things done, sin, really, I think, all of the above. Consider the Lord's Prayer, which really could be called the Disciples' Prayer since it's how Jesus told the disciples to pray. I'll be, later on today, using a different from the usual version of it, the one found in number 894 in the United Methodist Hymnal called the Ecumenical Version. Usually at RVUMC we use trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But like, when was the last time you really stopped to think about what trespasses you have personally committed lately? Trespass suggests going where you aren't supposed to go, either physically, as in traipsing past a no trespassing sign, or verbally, I'm not going to go there, or going where you shouldn't go. And it's all pretty vague and general often. So when you ask to be forgiven trespasses and say you forgive the trespasses of others, there's plenty of room for imagination for filling in your particular blanks. Maybe too much room, hard to tell. Which may be why the other most common version of the Lord's Prayer uses debts, as in forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Debts are somehow easier to define and to put a value on and more familiar in our day-to-day -day life. Home loan debt, car loan debt, student loan debt, Debt is something that lots of people can get their minds around, which is not to say that people are of one mind about how to approach debt. Even a few minutes perusing the teachings of various financial advice gurus turns up a whole range of attitudes toward debt. Is it all bad? Is there some good debt and some bad debt? And when you start to look at the current political controversies around student loan forgiveness, you realize that debts and the forgiving of them are incredibly complicated. The Greek word used in Matthew 6's version of the Lord's Prayer is ophelemata, and at its most basic it means things owed, things due. But as a footnote, the New English translation notes on debts. The parallel passage in Luke 11 uses the term sins, suggesting that debts here is used metaphorically to uh, refer to moral and ethical debts, in other words, sins, rather than merely financial obligations, though it has been suggested that the idea of debt forgiveness still lies at the root of Jesus' teaching here. Note the use of similar debt forgiveness imagery in parables like that of the unforgiving slave in Matthew 18. Which brings us to the ultimate, what are we to forgive anyway thing? Sin. The version of the Lord's Prayer that I'll say today has, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. When Christians pray this, we do so, I trust, with the understanding that Jesus, in Jesus, God has forgiven our sins, whatever they are, and that we, in turn, stand ready, willing, and able to forgive the sins, whatever they are, of others who have sinned against us. Which like so many things, is easier said than done and brings up the questions of who is forgiveness for and why forgive? Is it only for those who ask, beg, or plead for forgiveness? Does forgiveness only work if the person receiving the forgiveness is clearly and dramatically changed by being forgiven? If the person being forgiven neither asks for nor seems to be changed by it, should you even bother? As Jesus' parable portrays forgiveness, it is most definitely to be extended to those who ask. 
the Lord's Prayer and human experience more generally leave the question of what about those who don't ask leaves that ambiguous. Forgive us as we forgive others. One of the most dramatic recent cases of unasked for forgiveness being given to a perpetrator who seems both not to appreciate the forgiveness but also not to be remorseful in the least comes out of Charleston, South Carolina. That is, unasked for forgiveness that was extended to the white supremacist who killed nine members of a Bible study at Emanuel AME in June of 2015. Do you remember that? Just days after he killed their loved ones, some of the family members addressed the killer at his bond hearing, extending forgiveness to him. According to the CNN report, his response, a blank expression. And the subsequent years have not yielded anything resembling remorse or repentance from the killer. The offer of forgiveness, though, can have an effect upon the individuals who extend it. The Reverend Anthony Thompson, whose wife Myra was killed in that massacre, even wrote a book, which I confess I have yet to read, called Called to Forgive. Earlier this year, he was interviewed. For Thompson, like many other family members, summing up the last eight years is not easy, but he said granting forgiveness is what ultimately helped him through the heartbreak. Forgiving him and other family members forgiving him made a difference in how I feel right now, he shared. His path to forgiveness began when he spoke at the gunman's bond hearing after his arrest. You know, I experienced a whole lot in just a few minutes, he said. I thought that I was up there for hours. Before that day in court, Thompson says he was ready to give up after losing his wife. I fell on the ground crying and I really couldn't take it, he said. I threw in the towel and I told God, I'm not going to pastor. Don't expect me to be in church on Sunday. I literally threw in the towel. But Thompson says God would speak to him about forgiveness, and when he finally decided to listen, it changed everything. Instantly, immediately, I was released, he shared. Anger, hate, everything I felt, even sadness, it was gone. I received peace like no other. Peace like no other in that context of overwhelming anger and that's a testimony that makes me think maybe, just maybe, there can be times when unasked for forgiveness given to an unrepentant sinner can be effective. Clearly, for some of the survivors of the AME church shooting, extending such forgiveness helped them to heal, never mind the killer. That is a pretty strong reason in favor of forgiveness. I'm in awe of those folks who have taken Jesus' teaching on forgiveness and practice it so fully. But I have to confess I find myself probably more likely to see the prospect of extending unasked for forgiveness to someone and unrepentant, similarly to Christian Cooper, also known as the Black Central Park bird watcher. If you recall, in 2020, Cooper had a white woman call 911 on him, telling them that he was threatening her life after he asked her to leash her dog in accordance with park regulations. Though Mr. Cooper declined to be involved with prosecuting her for her false report, reasoning that she had certainly suffered enough public humiliation, including the loss of her job, he has also resisted feel-good, made-for-TV opportunities for a face-to-face -face meeting. My sense is that if the woman who made that 911 call approached him personally with genuine repentance, he would be open to forgiveness and reconciliation, but to throw forgiveness out there unasked and clearly unappreciated? Not going to happen, he says. So, it's complicated. Lord, forgive us 
our sins, our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive. As we forgive. Which is how? Perhaps for those of us who say we are Christians, it means not doing a couple of popular things. One is being sure of payback. Let's not focus on payback. Instead, let's pay forward God's love in this world. And the other thing not to do is forgive and forget. Let's not do that either. Let's forgive and let's remember what we have been forgiven, that we may live forward with grace and gratitude. Thanks be to God. Today's prayer is based on the Book of Common Prayer, Form 6, and will be followed by the ecumenical version of the Lord's Prayer, which, if you have a United Methodist hymnal, can be found at number 894. Let us pray. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For our Bishop Thomas Bickerton, our District Superintendent Karen Monk, and all the other leaders of our churches, for all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of our congregation. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you for all the blessings of this life. Now hear us as we pray as you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
name. Amen.